Hey, Linda. Hi, um, I just wanted to thank you guys for um, putting this on. This is fantastic. Um, so I was struck by um, Borshika when you were talking. Um, I'm looking at the slide where you went through the, um, the grants that were funded, I think, by NIH and about like what theories they used and about, um, you know, almost half of them had no theory or framework. And I'm wondering, I guess, what I had learned from my research fellowship and since then is how important it is to have some type of conceptual framework or theory. And so I guess I'm just curious if you all could comment, given maybe you've had experience reviewing proposals, if you could speak to, you know, what is it maybe about, or your hypothesis, what is it about such proposals that make them successfully funded, and also if you think that there's a trend, like if that's becoming, um, if not having a theory or framework these days seems like it would be a big disadvantage to, to thinking about a grant proposal. I would love Russ to start and then Ross if we can because you too have been reviewing a number of proposals. Okay, yeah, and again Ross is the current uh, chair of the study section. So uh, I'll just uh, start off with a couple of comments. First of all, you're right on. That, that's exactly right. And I think that's one of the things that the field needs and we would hope to see. Secondly, there, there needs to be an important qualification. And I believe this was from the abstracts because the entire grants are not publicly available. So what this means is they didn't explicitly call it out. Doesn't mean that they didn't use one, although frankly it's a pretty major error or uh, faux pas if they didn't, if they used one and didn't call it out in the abstract, that's not a good thing to do as a grantee. But there, but there is that qualification. But I do think over time we're, we're seeing more of that. The slightly more subtle question or issue, and again, this is a segue to, uh, to, to Ross without hopefully stealing his uh, thunder perspective, is saying the, the current, what I would say a current problem and a reason a lot of grants don't get funded is now they give lip service and they'll toss out, oh, I'm using diffusion of innovation or re-aim or CIFR or whatever in the introduction and then it goes away and you never see it anywhere else and it's not integrated into the methods, into the intervention. There's no measures of it, of how, to, how is it used. So I think that's the current challenge we're seeing is how are you really using this theory or framework? But Ross? Not much less to say, that was perfect. Um, the, and, we'll, and we'll cover some of this tomorrow when we talk, I guess, no, that's, is that tomorrow or today? This afternoon, yeah forget what day it is, um, when we talk about sort of keys to getting your DNI grant funded. The only other thing I would add, because I think it is a, it's a great question, is keep in mind that it's the abstract, but it also mixes up, you know, an R03 grant, an R21, so some smaller grants. So if you were doing a small measures development grant, you might be filling in the pieces that will later inform your framework. So. For a, for a beginning, you know, early stage grant, it may not be that you're even ready to identify a framework yet. And so for that kind of grant, it's probably not a fatal flaw, but for the larger grants, you know, a true DNI study, the, the, the framework really should be stated up front and, as Russ said, carried through all the, all the phases of the proposal. You know, I, would, I guess I was chair of that committee before you, and so I'm a little bit out of touch in terms of exactly what's going on there now. But, but I would just add that when I was there, there was a distinction between studies that were really more on the, the level of what might be considered a demonstration project, so taking a framework and using it to, um, to demonstrate that you could put an evidence-based uh, intervention into practice in a new setting and studies that were really trying to advance the science of um, implementation and dissemination, studying maybe what key aspects within a framework are really important from a process point of view. The latter kinds of studies got a lot more enthusiasm in the review group at that time than the former time, mm -hmm. where it was just this intervention worked here, we want to see if we can make it work here in a different setting, and we're going to use this framework to support implementation. Those sometimes got funded, fundable scores, if there was something really exciting, right? But those didn't seem to be the sort of thing that, was a, that were advancing the science so much. And so they often, even if they were very well written, very meritorious, they just didn't get enough impact um, to, to get over the hump.
So I work for the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization, so we work on contracts directed by CMS. And one of the things that I struggle with is the fact that we're not really directing the research, we're getting directives, but I'm wondering about how you can kind of back in to a framework once you've been given marching orders, because I think that that's something we lack when mm -hmm. we're working with the federal government sometimes, and so I'd be interested in hearing about that. Good question. Uh, you kind of you stumped the chump up here anyway. Maybe somebody else has a, uh, a, a, better, uh, a better answer to it. But I, but I have seen post hoc uh, appl applications of things. Uh, in some ways, my off-the-cuff answer is it's uh, sometimes easier to do that with a, a simpler framework. Some of the more complex frameworks, like just off the top of my head, uh, CFER or precede proceed or whatever that, that have a lot of different interactive components and probably the classic one and one of the ones that was a huge I think scientific advance but almost impossible many of us have found to use is Trish Greenhalge's uh, initial synthesis or whatever that kind of preceded the consolidated framework or whatever that's there that where there's so many things so if you're going to back into one I might uh, suggest two things and then I'm going to defer to my colleagues who may have a better answer than uh, then, then I'm stumbling around to try and give you here, is um, to the other is to look at uh, these figures that Ross mentioned to you too and just see which things kind of resonate. If you're backing into it, nothing is probably going to fit perfectly, but you might find some that have a particular issue that they're focused on, like are they more focused on adoption or sustainability? Uh, which level do they focus on? Do they focus on an entire community level or more at the individual level? Uh, then those other dimensions that uh, Borsica summarized for you too, along which the theories vary. Julie? So um, I'm Julie Lowry from the VA, and I'm going to be talking about the CFER. And you actually can use the CFER pretty well for backing, backing in. in. Okay. So sure. what you can do retrospectively, it won't help you necessarily with your particular initiative, but you can learn from it. And we do a lot of sort of retro, maybe retrospective is the wrong word, but once something has been implemented, we do a lot of looking back to see what happened. And we do a lot of post hoc interviews with the participants in that initiative to see how things went and why it worked well or why it didn't work well, because that's going to be very important, right, for informing future initiatives. And we do use the CFER. Um, we pick and choose, um, and I'll be talking about that this afternoon, how you might pick and choose a subset of yes. relevant constructs. And it's actually, I mean, because you can't apply the CFER as a whole. It has about 40 different constructs. But you can um, work with the key participants in your initiative to, to identify the subset of constructs that they think were most um, important in the implementation. You design your interview guide or your survey around those constructs, and then you interview or administer the survey and see. So what happened with leadership? Was leadership supportive? And you look at the sites that did well and the sites who didn't do so well, and you find out more about what happened. Or you pick another construct like relative advantage. Um, what was it about the intervention that did or didn't seem to have an advantage over pre whatever? You pick the different constructs and you say what happened. And that can be very, very helpful for down the road. Doesn't help, again, with your particular initiative at that point, but it still can yield some really important information that will help you in the future. Thanks much, Julie. First of all, I, I appreciate the, uh, the education here. Uh, continue to learn myself. And also, I, I want to emphasize the point that whichever one, uh, you can use elements uh, from it, too. And we certainly say that with REAIM. REAIM, not all the elements fit every particular thing. And as you said, with regards to CFER, but you can think of our, are there certain constructs here or whatever. The, the one caveat I will say there, and uh, actually one of the readings out on the table is a recent uh, paper that, that we've done on REAIM, and I think the same probably applies to other ones, saying, what does it mean, you know, to apply the REAIM framework, and how much do you have to do? So the only caveat I would say 
is, in terms of being transparent, is just saying, I'm using these elements from this framework or this theory. But sometimes people get upset if you say you're using CIFR and out of the 40 things, you only use two. Okay, Or the same with re-aim. If you only use one of the things, it's fine to do that, but say I'm just using adoption or I'm just using reach from re-aim. But don't say I'm using, yeah, and why if the others aren't appropriate, but don't say you're using the entire framework if, if you're not. So. So one more question, and then, then I'll uh, actually get to what Borsica asked me to do, OK? <laughs> so you had asked for surprises. Yes. And um, I think for me, coming from mental health, I was surprised not to see the NERN framework up there, the National Implementation yes. Research Network, Dean Fix It, because in, I think, in all of social science, social services, education, mental health, it's by far the most widely used. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Uh, I could let Borsica respond. I think what you're seeing is largely a disciplinary difference. And those of you that are um, from nursing might want to comment too. But nursing has a number of other frameworks. Uh, particularly, I'd, I'd say, in mental health and uh, also in education. Uh, that's that's uh, been the, uh, the, the NERN framework. Um, there are different groups that do different things, but I, I, I thank you for your contribution. That is another one. Um, I'll, again, I'll let uh, Borsica or Elaine respond, but again, there, uh, actually, I think there's now at least uh, 65 that, and counting, probably, in addition to the 61, and they, you know, had to, had to make some, some really tough choices, but I, I think that's right, and particularly, again, looking at that fit, if you're thinking about mental health or, or education, that, that's been used a lot. Uh, the other thing that might have been underplayed a little bit since you brought it up, from an international perspective, since, you know, we all tend to be pretty uh, ethnocentric here or culture, a lot of the Canadian frameworks, I think, the knowledge to action framework, and frankly, even if you looked around the world, probably the term knowledge translation may be more widely used than is DNI or implementation science or whatever, uh, even. So that that's another one. But again, it, it's a tough thing, and I, I don't know. But I'll, I'll let Borsica respond to see if she wants to add anything. <laughs> Jean Kuttner, who's been involved with the CRISP Center as well, who couldn't be here today, when she attended the NIH TIDER with the Institute on Dissemination, one of the things she walked away with was this notion, oh my gosh, there's so many frameworks. But the key point is to choose a framework because you are likely to be more successful and efficient in imp implementing or understanding if it worked, right? And so that might be a rationale, you know, to the degree government wants to be efficient and, you know, um, bigger bang for the buck kind of thing, too. Um, and so it, it can, you can get bogged down in choosing one, but it's the idea to choose one and be thoughtful and carry it through. Um, I'm really new to this area, and what's confusing me the most is you're talking about these frameworks and picking a framework, but I've yet to hear what are the essential components of an adequate framework. And I actually come from animal research in which when you think about an animal model of a biological process, there are certain components that you expect that model to re reflect, and I would assume that that's the same. Is that actually laid out in the paper that reviews the 61, 65 frameworks? You want to, Ross or Borsica, you want to? So yeah, give me the hard questions. <laughs> um, you, you, you noticed that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give this back to Russ. But it's a great question. Um, we do try in there to say, okay, if you're doing more of a policy study, here's a set of frameworks that might fit, and here are the constructs in those frameworks that you might look at and say. So in some ways, you, you sort of can, can start, you know, you know, one way to think about it is, is think of the key constructs or domains within the study you're doing, and then sort of start looking at some of these frameworks on the continuum is this more of a, you know, something at a policy level? Is it more at a clinical level? Is it more of an individual level? Is it more of an implementation study or dissemination study? And when we start looking at that, it does help you match up. Um, you know, it, you know, what I would think of is that the TABIC article is kind of a, a first cut through to look at because as, as it was just mentioned, there are definitely frameworks in there I'm sure we missed. We, we made a judgment in what we put in there that we would focus more on our judgment of more research frameworks compared to practice frameworks, because there's a lot of frameworks out there that are sort of practice-based 
but didn't have much in the research literature, much about measurement or much about sort of how you would apply this in a research study. And that was sort of an arbitrary cut we made, and I'm sure we made some, some wrong calls on it. Um, but, but I guess it's sort of a first cut through is the best way I could say it. Um, but I think exactly what you're talking about, you know, sort of thinking about the questions you're asking, what's going to fit going all the way through from the aims all the way to the analysis in your study, and what, what constructs of the framework are going to make sense. Yeah, I, I, I concur with that. Oh, go ahead. Just wanted go to ahead. actually direct to you, because I know that I saw a few slides from you that start to say that there are some um, commonalities across yeah. frameworks, in, and one of them is context. Yeah. And, and I think that you might. Yeah, I, I think that that is what we're looking for is kind of what are the, the merging uh, commonalities. I, I, if I understood your question right, though, uh, let me just take a slightly different uh, angle in, in answering it. Uh, but both of those, I, I think, are correct. But there's at least three and maybe four different groups of theories, models, and actually I think we usually say theory models or frameworks, but they're, they're, they're quite different. Uh, frankly, they're also, they vary a lot at their level of validation um, and their level of practical application. Some of them tend to be more towards a traditional theory, okay, which is very explicit about making, if from Popper's perspective, falsifiable uh, hypothesis and things like that. Uh, uh, a lot of those uh, tend to be used in research, but not so much, in my estimation, in application in real-world work. On the other end, there's a number of them that may seem to you or others more like just common sense, and there isn't any great theory, but they're just, uh, here's things that come up and a place to look or whatever to, to do a uh, framework there, but that they might guide you're thinking either to design, and again, we're going to give you an exercise, a concrete exercise uh, here in just a moment on, on one of them, the REAIM framework, uh, about how you might think about planning. And here's some common stumbling issues, roadblocks, places where people stumble when they're trying to uh, translate things into policy or practice. So they're kind of more where to shine the light rather than what you or others might call an, you know, an explicit uh, theory. And then, even within these frameworks, there are some that really focus on how to change, if you will, often we're talking about behavior, how to change behavior or what's the evidence-based practice that you're talking about. And then there are other ones that are what we call implementation strategies. It's about how you get the behavior change into practice. So you may have the evidence-based practice. So probably now that I've totally confused you, um, let, let me just uh, end, end with one other thing, and then I will set up this exercise to have you think about that, uh, that we're doing. And that is the model that I think George Bach said it, although it's a disputed uh, attribution. But I think the notion is uh, all models are wrong theory, and that certainly includes re-aim. Um, but some models are useful. So I think that's the thing to keep in mind, and at least from my perspective, rather than having these arguments that end up being kind of more mud wrestling and more generate more heat than light about my theory or model's better than yours or whatever, it's kind of, is it useful for my application, for understanding, as, uh, as Julie said, uh, for this application? Does, does it help me think about some things that I wouldn't have thought about and provide some guidance for either for the evaluation or for when I'm planning what I'm doing. Okay, with that, what I'm asked to do, and tell me if I, because I'm still not exactly sure, to be to give you the honest truth, uh, this is kind of live and unrehearsed. Borsig and I were emailing like at 3.30 this morning, so uh, so we're kind of making it up. But, but I think I'm supposed to give you a background about a study we did that will set up an exercise you're doing later in the day, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so you might make make some notes and we actually did use and uh actually you can help us and tell us where we messed up applying the reaim framework. You'll probably have some better applications than we did. But but this study that we're going to talk about is called Be Fit Be Well and you'll have a handout later in the day, but you may want to in a separate page start taking some notes now. Uh this was a weight loss study 
Uh, it was one of three projects funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, for pragmatic trials to create weight loss in individuals who were not only overweight or obese. We don't have any slides, do we, for, for this? We do. Just go down. Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. Voila. That makes it much easier. Thank you. <laughs> this is what you asked me to do a half hour ago. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so this study was called Be Fit, Be Well. Uh, you probably can't read there, but uh, this was a, a consortium of individuals who was led by folks who were then at Harvard. I don't know what happened during the study that drove everybody out of Harvard, but uh, the, uh, the principal investigator was Gary Bennett, who's one of the leaders in the e-health movement and also a, a well-known DNI researcher, um, and uh, involved people like uh, Karen Emmons and others, and uh, I and uh, others, uh, including uh, Deb Ritzwaller, who's going to talk with you about health economic issues later today, were also involved with it. Um, this was a 24-month, it was a, 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 a patient-level randomized uh, trial uh, with relatively complex, pretty high-risk inner-city patients who were obese uh, but also had hypertension, and many of them also had three or four other conditions. But the notion was it wasn't just obesity, but they had at least, least hypertension and many of them other Things. And this has been, uh, particularly this inner city African American audience, has been one that uh, either hasn't received as much attention in weight loss or where they have, the results haven't, haven't been near as good. So uh, the idea was this was a partnership with uh, local community health centers uh, in, in uh, inner city uh, Boston. Um, and it was a generally, it, Technically, it didn't meet all the criteria, but technically was a more pragmatic. It certainly was an implementation study. And we used REAIM to both help plan the intervention and, and how it was going to be uh, delivered and also to evaluate it. And uh, that's kind of the thing. We're going to tell you how we did it later. But what we'd like to do is set up, I'll briefly answer any questions you have about the study or the context. But we'd like you to be thinking about it from what Borsica has presented. And then later on, there's some tools in a, a handout that you have, one of the handouts you have for you that looks like this, I think. Uh, two, that, that you'll be used that, that talks about the REAIM components. But for now, I'm just trying to set it up, and I'll quickly answer any questions you have um, about the study to give you a little more background. Um, that doesn't give you much background. Uh, let's see. It was the intervention was a combination uh, high-tech, high-touch. Uh, Gary Bennett has done some great work. Uh, with interactive technologies for low literacy uh, and uh, lower, uh, lower education uh, level folks, uh, tailored particularly to African Americans. And so it was designed around a technology for weight loss using some standard behavioral weight loss principles, especially self-monitoring of health behaviors and weight that people uh, would do and could kind of develop personalized, uh, tailored, tailored strategies. Um, they, they did this, uh, an interesting thing uh, was through their choice of which technology uh, that they would use. So they got the same principles and the same intervention, but they could choose whether to use internet or cell phone, uh, excuse me, uh, a, a phone-based uh, intervention, uh, use the, the jargony word is interactive voice response technology, uh, but it's basically where you call in on your, uh, your uh, cell phone and you have the same computer framework but do it over your phone and it's more mobile or whatever than, uh, than the internet. Um, the high touch part of it was we tried to work with something that would work with this audience that would make sense and be generalizable, although I'm giving away some of our, our secrets, our planning now, uh, in doing this in community health centers. So it used community health workers. And actually, in addition to the tech piece of it for weight loss, to kind of provide some glue and some continuity, community health workers both did phone calls and then invited participants to come in for some group sessions. The group sessions were optional, but for both support and other things. And then uh, the community health worker would also try to link those 
who wished with other community uh, resources as well. So just to give you an idea of the scope and the context uh, of the study, again, this was the website. I guess I don't have much more here, but we'll have a handout later. Uh, but this was just a simple two-arm uh, RCT. Uh, one of the maybe unique things about it, it was a little longer than your usual study. Rather than three or six or even 12 months, it was a 24-month study. So you'll want to be thinking about maintenance. That was one of the issues was maintenance uh, at, uh, in the study. Uh, just to give you an idea of the context, these were very, very low-income folks. Uh, this was during... Uh, I think it was conducted between 2000, most of it between 2008, 2009, maybe the first part of 2010. So this was the time when the economy kind of collapsed. A lot of these people were losing their housing and things like that. Um, but uh, the sample size was 365 individuals, and it was either usual care assisted by a what we thought might be a kind of common thing to provide some standardization, a pamphlet, a brochure, a handout that was given by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute since they, they were the funders. Uh, but other than that, it was pretty much else what they and their healthcare team would do with this standardized pamphlet versus this combination high-tech, high-touch uh, intervention. So 365 individuals, 71% uh, were African-American, 13% were Hispanic. As with many weight loss interventions, uh, it was predominantly female. About two-thirds were female. Uh, again, a number of them were real low, uh, low, low education. And I think I'll maybe stop there. Is there, Corsica, anything else I should give them in terms of context? Usual care was either whatever they would uh, normally do supplemented by this pamphlet, and I apologize, I can't remember the name of, but it's a reasonably well done print pamphlet, but it was just handed with some kind of standard tips used by the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, kind of greatest tips for, for losing weight or whatever. Yes? Oh, thank you, all primary care. It was a community health center, think about, and a community health center that did have community health workers integrated uh, with it. And so a lot of the intervention actually was done more by the community health worker than, say, by the primary care doc or even nurses or whatever. But it was linked in. An important part of it was getting the primary care provider to endorse it. Again, I don't want to go give away too much more of some of the other things we thought was important, but it, but it did all take place. Uh, and it was actually one of three primary care, uh, primary care centers. So this was just to give you a basic idea. We will give you a summary of this information before you do the exercise. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, please do ask them. We will give you an opportunity to ask questions before you start the exercise as well. So I think that you will have more. So what we're doing here is big idea with frameworks, a case in which it's a real kind of problem. The next two modules or sections are going to walk you through of, okay, how do I think about designing an intervention, right? So we'll, we'll pull out some of these points that you're raising, thinking of the audience, thinking of what's current norms and practices, right? And hearing from experts how they've done it in other settings. The second module will be thinking about, okay, now you've done an intervention, how might you think about evaluating it? So you'll be getting these two different types of concepts and we'll come back to this case now that we hope that you've had some more learning and say, okay, let's practice and see if we can apply what we've been talking about to a case using a framework, in this case, re-aim, because we thought it would also be something that was um, intuitive to get started with in this kind of one-day session. Okay, so that's the thought process, and we just decided to share it with you now because I like to think about the big picture before I have to do details. So some people learn that way, so that's why we shared it now, so that you can be reflecting on it, talking about it over.